due to technical difficulties, I don't have slides tonight. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. But um, we'll start in Lamentations. We have been doing a series of lessons on open fellowship, uh, which we started two, three Sundays ago, whatever. There were two lessons so far, and they were both on Sunday night, so however many that is. <laughs> Uh, about Jehoshaphat and Ahab's court. And uh, now we're moving to a different um, place. Here we're looking at the uh, lamentations, the destruction of Jerusalem and of uh, uh, well, I guess Zion of Judah, the kingdom as opposed to Israel, you know, the twelve, the uh, the ten tribes of Israel were taken captive by um, Assyria, and that was some years ago, at the time that Judah is left, and Jeremiah has been prophesying to them, and they are carried as well by Babylon. This relates to open fellowship because. I think we need to look at what happened to Judah. They're the people of God, obviously. Uh, there were some who feared the Lord in Israel, and they certainly suffered because of the sins of the nation. But Judah is said to be treacherous. <laughs> Where Israel was faithless, Judah is treacherous, as in they should know better, or maybe even they do know better, but they're just pretending. So we find in Lamentations a picture of Judah at the time of its destruction, at the time of its visitation at the hands of Babylon. And I think it's important to look at this picture and to see what happened to Judah because we're going to ask the next question, which is, how did we get here? The answer to that is Jeremiah chapter 6. But first, let's look at Lamentations and see where are we? What is this? First one is verse 1 of chapter 1. I will just pick out some of the verses along the way here for us. Lamentations 1 verse 1. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow she, she has become. She who was great among the nations. She who was a princess among the provinces has become a slave. So yes, uh, one of the things that I think about sometimes with regard to the faithful being small in number is Lamentations 1.1, how lonely sits the city that was full of people. And it's true, there used to be a lot more people who feared the Lord, it seems. There used to be a lot more people who wanted to do right, and uh, the churches have dwindled in number. This is due to doctrinal error in the churches, which is due to the desires of the people to have something other than the word of God. In Lamentations 1 at verse 5, her foes have become the head, her enemies prosper, because the Lord has afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions. Her children have gone away captives before the foe. So this again is to say it's her transgressions are the reason for this affliction. But because of it, the city is lonely. The city is a slave. The foes have become the head. The enemies prosper. At verse 10, the enemy has stretched out. In ungraceful page turn. <laughs> the enemy has stretched out his hands over all her precious things, for she has seen the nations enter her sanctuary, those whom you forbade to enter your congregation. So what has happened to Judah? Well, it's being destroyed. It's being afflicted. Everything that you might be afraid of that it is few in number, that it is low in rank, the, its enemies have power over it, the children are gone, all the precious things are in the hands of the enemy, the sanctuary is defiled by people whom God forbade to enter. 
everything that you are afraid of happening, which is the reason for which you make compromise with sin and make compromise with doctrinal error, is what will happen to you because you make compromise with sin and compromise with doctrinal error. At verse 12 down through 15 of Lamentations 1, we read this. Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Look and see if there's any sorrow like my sorrow which was brought upon me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. From on high he sent fire, into my bones he made it descend, he spread a net for my feet, he turned me back, he has left me stunned, faint all the day long. My transgressions were bound into a yoke, by his hand they were fastened together, they were set upon my neck, he caused my strength to fail. The Lord gave me into the hands of those whom I can't withstand. The Lord rejoiced, or rejected rather, the Lord rejected all my mighty men in my midst. He summoned an army against me, an assembly against me to crush my young men. The Lord is trodden as in a winepress, the virgin daughter of Judah. So who is this? Well, it's Judah. They're supposed to be the faithful, the ones who stuck it out after Israel. But they are being destroyed, as you can see. Fire from on high, affliction, a net for the feet. We go to chapter 2 of Lamentations. At verse 5, the Lord has become like an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. He has swallowed up all its palaces. He's laid in ruins its strongholds and multiplied in the daughter of Judah mourning and lamentation. Which continues at verse 8. The Lord determined to lay in ruins the wall of the daughter of Zion. He stretched out the measuring line. He did not restrain his hand from destroying. He caused rampart and wall to lament. They languished together. Verse 9, her gates have sunk into the ground. He's ruined and broken her bars. Her king and princes are among the nations. The law is no more. Her province find no vision from the Lord. Think about what's happened here. The Lord has become like an enemy to his own people. Verse 5 says, He swallowed its palaces. He laid in ruins the strongholds. He made a determination in verse 8 to lay in ruins the wall. The rampart and the wall languished. The gates are sunk into the ground, verse 9. He ruined and broken the bars. And then you find that in the city itself, the, the, um, the, the hierarchy, the, the leadership, the king and the princes are, no, are out scattered among the nations. They're not here. The law is no more. The prophets find no vision from the Lord. It's gone. It's done. Everything is destroyed. There's no defense. There's no containment. There's no leadership. The 14th verse captures this. Your prophets have seen for you false and deceptive visions. They have not exposed your iniquity to restore your fortunes, but have seen for you oracles that are false and and misleading. That is one of the issues here in Lamentations 2.14. The prophets have not exposed their iniquity to restore their fortunes. They have false, misleading, deceptive visions for the people, which is what they demanded to have. Truth be told, but Lamentations 2.14 records that idea that the prophets have seen this thing which turned into your trouble, your iniquity, your sin is not being exposed so as to restore your fortunes. That is to say, this could have been avoided if we had dealt with the iniquity that was in us. If we had dealt with the wrongdoing, we wouldn't be in this situation, which is a dire one. Yeah, verse 20 of chapter 2, Lamentation, 
Look, Lord, and see, with whom have you dealt thus? Whether it's with his own people, it's with Judah. Should women eat the fruit of their womb, the children of their tender care? Should priest and prophet be killed in the sanctuary of the Lord? In the dust of the streets lie the young and the old. My young women, my young men have fallen by the sword. You've killed them in the day of your anger, slaughtering without pity. You summoned as if to a festival day my terrors on every side. On the day of the anger of the Lord, no one escaped or survived. Those whom I held and raised, my enemy destroyed. It's a terrible thing to think about the destruction that happened there. What a horrible idea that everybody you know is being slaughtered by a foreign enemy in the gate, and that the gate was broken by God himself. He's the reason why this is happening um, in the specific sense that he has unleashed this punishment. They are the reason it's happening because they didn't do what was right. They did not listen to counsel. They did not repent. Chapter 3. I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. So this chapter introduces a first-person uh, perspective. And I think, too, that this chapter very clearly is looking forward to the Christ. If you read through the rest of the chapter, you will see that it, it, it contains many references to the way that Jesus is treated. But taking this in a personal way is what Lamentations 3 is about. And the 8th and ninth verses continue. Here we are. Though I call and cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has blocked my ways with blocks of stones. He has made my paths crooked. That's so different from what you read in Proverbs and Psalms and in Moses about the Lord making straight paths for your feet, the word of God shedding light on the way. That's not what happens in the day of visitation like this. He said, I call and cry for help, but he shuts out my prayer. And that to me is probably one of the most, one of the most terrible things you can think of is to be in this world without God. That would be horrible. He's not listening. He, you, you can call, you can cry, you can pray, but he's not listening. That's terrible. We don't want to get to that place. And that's why we're asking, how did we get here? Look how terrible here is, but how did we get here? 15th verse says, He has filled me with bitterness. He has sated me with wormwood. Or gall. 17 and 18, My soul is bereft of peace. I've forgotten what happiness is. So I say, my endurance has perished. So has my hope from the Lord. This is dried up, is what's happening. The endurance is gone. The hope is gone. The prayers are not answered. They have plenty, but not of food, of bitterness and wormwood. There is no peace. There is no happiness. All the things that you were promised were lies with open fellowship error. It was all lies. It ends this way. In chapter 4, in verse 4, the tongue of the nursing infant sticks to the roof of its mouth for thirst. The children beg for food, but no one gives to them. Those who once feasted on delicacies perish in the streets. Those who were brought up in purple embrace ash heaps. For the chastisement of the daughter of my people has been greater than the punishment of Sodom, which was overthrown in a moment, and no hands were wrung for her. In the ninth verse, happier were the victims of the sword than the victims of hunger who wasted away 
pierced by lack of the fruit of the field. The hands of compassionate women have boiled their own children. They became their food during the destruction of the daughter of my people. So these are horrible things. You talk about horrible. They're trapped. Their very survival is at stake. The things that they become willing to do under the duress of a siege and famine are unimaginable things. In chapter 5, at verse 7, Our fathers sinned and are no more. We bear their iniquities. Slaves rule over us. There's none to deliver us from their hand. We get our bread at the peril of our lives because of the sword in the wilderness. Our skin is hot as an oven with the burning heat of famine. Women are raped in Zion, young women in the towns of Judah. Princes are hung up by their hands. No respect is shown to the elders. Young men are compelled to grind at the mill. Boys stagger under loads of wood. This is the end of fellowship with sin. This is the end of compromise. So when we are talking about the open fellowship movement, the open fellowship error among the saints, this is the reason why. Look at where this ends. This is where it's going. The destruction, the spiritual destruction of the children of God is where it leads. Because you can read these horrible things and say, yeah, this is terrible. And these are the, the, ter the horrors of war, which is true. War is like this, in fact. This is why uh, even General Schwarzkopf said any soldier worth his salt is basically anti-war. And yet, there are things worth fighting for. It's the rest of that quote, to be fair to him. But he's right. Any soldier worth his salt is basically anti-war. We don't want to go to war. This is what war looks like. Um, we think about it, we think that's a terrible thing, and yet, you know, sometimes you get invaded. Yeah, but this is the people of God. This is the promised land the nation of his keeping and of his blessing. And this is happening to them because, as it said very plainly, the Lord allowed this to happen to them. Why? Well, it said because of their transgressions, because they had done wrong, because they wouldn't repent, because their prophets wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't allow their prophets to tell them what they needed to do to be right with God. They wouldn't be corrected. which is how we end up over in Jeremiah chapter 6. How did we get here? Well, I mean, it starts a long time back in Jeremiah, I will back up a couple of verses in chapter 5. Jeremiah 5, 30. An appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. And we just read about some appalling and horrible things. But Jeremiah 6 is written years before the destruction of Jerusalem. While the city was full of people, while there was Lots of money, lots of food, everything that they needed, everything to feel comfortable and to think that nothing was going to happen and that Jeremiah was just a crotchety old guy. <laughs> and the Lord said to the prophet, an appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. The priests rule at their own direction. And my people love to have it so. But what will you do when the end comes? 
And that's the basis of this lesson. The appalling and the horrible thing in the land is when the prophets prophesy falsely, the priests give directions according to their own decisions instead of what God said in the word, and the people love to have it so. That is a horrible and appalling thing. Nothing describes open fellowship error better. The preachers are telling the people lies about the ability to be right with God while living wrong, to be in fellowship with the Son of God, to be walking in the light while embracing the darkness in the practices of others. No, you can't do that. That's not right at all. They're lying about this. The priests, uh, you know, at their own direction, you know, there aren't very many better examples of this than the series of articles that Ed Harrell wrote in Christianity Magazine about uh, Homer Haley and the defense of him and the, the boundaries of Christian fellowship, I believe it's called. There is a priest, if you will, working at his own direction. He came up with a new way of managing fellowship, came up with a new way of handling problems among the brethren. And it was absorbed, it was, it was uh, influential, it won the day among the churches. It is the way that most of the non-institutional churches uh, started to do everything, if they weren't already. And you see that that's how it is today. Today, that is most of what is available. Most churches follow these practices. So Jeremiah 6 is where you start to talk about these things. <clears throat> that the war is coming. You know, the, the, the northern army is coming. And he says in Jeremiah 6, 10, To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ears are uncircumcised, they cannot listen. Behold, the word of the Lord is to them an object of scorn, they take no pleasure in it. Yep, that's what happens. People are not interested in doing his will, they just want to get along, go along to get along, they just want to play church, they just want to do what their family has always done which I don't see how that's different from a Baptist or Methodist or a Muslim, for that matter. It's not. They have no interest in God's word. They're not listening for God's word. As he said, to whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? They can't hear because they're not listening for his word. They don't respect his authority. They're not concerned about what God wants. If they were, they wouldn't be in those places. The ears are uncircumcised. They can't listen. The word of the Lord is an object of scorn. They take no pleasure in it. Thirteenth verse of Jeremiah 6. From the least to the greatest of them... Everyone is greedy for unjust gain. From prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. They've healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. That's how it is. They're greedy for unjust gain. Now, this isn't just about money. This is about repayment in whatever form it takes. Uh, positions among the people, um, a name that is respected, a family that is respected, the approval of people who are important to you, whether they are your family members, your community members, your uh, fellow Christians, whatever it is, this is what you want and how you are being paid off and you're greedy for that unjust gain. They've healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. This is what the lamentation said. Your prophets <clears throat> are prophesying lies to you. They're not addressing your iniquity so that you can restore your fortunes. It's this. They're healing the wound of the people lightly. 
Okay, the people have sinned in some way, and the sin needs to be rebuked, and they need to repent and make that right with God. But they're not going to because the prophets are telling them, it's cool, it's all right, no worries. You won't be in trouble with God for this. Or as somebody famously said, you shall not surely die. In the 16th verse, thus says the Lord, Stand by the roads and look. Ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it. Find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk in it. I set watchmen over you, saying, Pay attention to the sound of the trumpet. What is that? That's the warning of an invading army. Pay attention to the sound of the trumpet. They said, We won't pay attention. Therefore, hear, O nations, know, O congregation, what will happen to them. Hear, O earth, behold, I am bringing disaster on this people, the fruit of their own devices, because they have not paid attention to my words, and as for my law, they have rejected it. What use to me is frankincense that comes from Sheba, or sweet cane from a distant land? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor your sacrifices pleasing to me. Yeah, it doesn't matter what we have that we think is on offer for God when we are not doing the right thing, when we are not holding the line of the truth. Then whatever we think we are offering, these lovely things, this, these large numbers of people or dollars or bricks, these uh, uh, degrees, these, uh, uh, I guess, the different... Uh, strata of society that we think are on offer, how we represent a diverse population, all these kinds of things that people count and think should be counted. The Lord says, what use is that to me? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable. Your sacrifices are not pleasing. Well, there's a lot to cover in this matter, but this is what happened. We see what happened, how terrible it is, the situation of Judah, the dire straits of the Lamentations. And you have to ask, how did we get here? I, I, you can't be honest and read that and wonder, how did the people of God end up in this situation? The promised land that they inherited, they have been disinherited from. And in such a manner as this, what happened? This is what happened. Jeremiah said these things very plainly. The reason for all of it was their faithlessness to God. We've said before that Israel's military strategy was neither. And that is true. What we mean by that is if their military strategy was not <clears throat> uh, by their own military might, it was by the strength that God provides. And the strategy didn't exist. The strategy was be faithful to God and God will take care of you. That's what you do. People make plans and strategies and uh, think that they are in control of their own destinies. <laughs> uh, but not so. The only thing you can control is whether you do right before God and God will bless you for that. All the rest of this there are no guarantees. <laughs> there are no guarantees. We don't know what's going to happen. And don't ask either. You don't want to know. <laughs> but truly, um, we got here somehow. And that's the thing. In the time when it was populous and wealthy and comfortable, you know, everybody thought Jeremiah was just, you know, a negative, you know, a negative Nancy. He's just always down, always, you know, can't say anything nice about, about us, you know, that kind of thing. But no, he was actually just telling them the truth. They needed to do right. When bad things happened, he wasn't happy about it. It was very sad. And that's what you're reading in the Lamentations. But... 
it is nonetheless what the Lord said he was going to do, and he won't be forsworn. I think the same people who think that God would not ever condemn somebody in hell are the people who think that it doesn't matter very much what you teach. Well, we'll have more to talk about in the next opportunity, but this is the lesson for today. Thinking about the Lamentations, I think is a terrible thing, and I uh, perhaps have gone over it kind of quickly for fear of discomfort uh, among some listening, but it is a terrible thing that happened, and it's because they were not faithful to the Lord. This would not have happened if they had been repentant, if they had lived right. And I'm telling you, the same thing is happening to the churches today. It's not going well with them. It may look like it's going well because they have numbers and they have young people. Uh, but what are they getting? You know, they're getting lies. They're getting subterfuge. Their children are being sold to Satan. They think their children are being strengthened because they have friends. And they have relationships. And they can go to Florida College and have hope of finding a mate to marry which the rest of us, frankly, have a very hard time doing. If you don't go to Florida College, the chances of finding a Christian mate are pretty low. But I'll take my chances. I don't want to be among the unfaithful. I think having somebody who is not faithful to God, but wears the name of faithfulness, is much worse than somebody who just doesn't believe in God. I think that's a much worse influence. And the children are not better off for having all of these social ties, making everything as hard as possible for them to love what is the truth and to live for it, to walk away from the, the unfaithful. That's all they're really doing is making it as hard as possible for their children to survive. They think this is helping them, but it's not. It's social ties. It's human means and human architecture for how things should be. It is not godly. They're selling their children to the devil and making it as hard as possible for them to stand for the truth. And it will end the way that this lamentation has ended, in the spirit. No, maybe not in the flesh, but in the spirit, the destruction is just as great. Its consequences are far greater. The children killed in Jerusalem by the sword of Babylon at least were safe and went to heaven. The children who were killed by false teaching, the children who were killed by error and compromise with sin are losing their eternal souls. That is a very serious matter. Well, we have more to talk about at the next opportunity today. If you are not a Christian, it's time to be a Christian to obtain for yourself forgiveness of sins if you realize that you stand condemned before God. We will help you in baptism for forgiveness of sins. If that is today your need, if tonight you have not been living right and you are a Christian, ask for the prayers of the saints. We're glad to help you. If today we can be of service in our prayers or in service to help you obey the gospel before it is too late, please let your need be known while we sing the song selected. <laughs>